For generations, southern Sudan has been dominated by the Islamist-run government in Khartoum, which has sought to impose Sharia law on the South's Christians and animists. Religion is one of the main causes of two bloody civil wars that have killed two million southern Sudanese. Another point of contention, control of Sudan's oil reserves that lie mostly in the south and along the border with the north. If, as expected, the south votes to secede, many fear another wave of violence, despite assurances from Sudan's president, Omar al-Bashir, that he will accept the results of the election. <laughs> But can Bashir be trusted? He's been indicted as a war criminal for his brutal military campaign against rebels and civilians in Darfur. That fighting, which began in 2003, has left 300,000 people dead. We sent producer George Lerner to southern Sudan to report on one former refugee's efforts to help rebuild his homeland in anticipation of a vote for independence. This is President Omar al-Bashir on Sudanese television three years ago. He's in Darfur laughing and dancing. It's days after the prosecutor of the International Criminal Court accused him of masterminding a genocide there. Bashir's response? Travel to the scene of his alleged crimes to send the world a message. That message was not lost on another part of Sudan, the South which is poised to vote in the coming week whether to separate from Bashir's government. I wish Bashir would not make things difficult on us. Salva Dut was born in southern Sudan. He suffered through years of war and exile and separation from his family. The 36-year-old was once a refugee in America, one of the so-called lost boys. But now he's found his way home to help rebuild one of the poorest places on earth. I want us to be independent, get separation, get away from northern Arabs, and let us start our life. It's two and a half weeks before the vote, and the country is buzzing with excitement. Nearly four million southern Sudanese have registered to vote, close to half the population. Poll workers are being trained to ensure a free and fair election. The ballots clearly lay out the choice for the southern Sudanese people, clasped hands to remain unified with the North, as they have been for a half century, or an open palm for independence. The world has gained a new nation. The Sudan, for 58 years under the joint rule of Britain and Egypt, becomes an independent republic. In 1956, the end of British colonialism merged two completely distinct regions, North and South Sudan, into Africa's largest nation. Premier Elazari thanks Britain and Egypt for giving his country freedom to work out its own destiny. But it was an arranged marriage and never a happy one. The British had handed control over the South to the government in Khartoum, the capital of the North. The northern part of the country is mainly Islamic and, and, and of Arab orientation. The southern part of the Sudan is 100% African in terms of culture, in terms of identity, in terms of languages. Dr. Barnaba Mariel Benjamin is the official spokesperson for the government of southern Sudan and says the union was never just. The laws which have been put in place do not give a chance to a citizen who is non-Arab, who is non-Islamic, and so you find yourself being discriminated in a country, being treated like a second-class citizen in a country which is yours. That sentiment was echoed throughout the streets of the South, where signs for separation are everywhere, leaving little doubt which way the vast majority are voting. We had been suffering since, let me say, 20 years ago. Yes, we want independence of Southern Sudan. The Sudan is going to separate immediately. In this referendum, the Sudanese women want to achieve peace. They don't want to hear any sound of a gun. That is the first thing. They want their country to be as peace as possible. The scars of decades of bloody civil war here are never far from reach. Still a dangerous place. And I don't want to get in there because it's not safe. This one is a rocket. Salva Du took us to the site of a fierce battle in 1998 for control of Wau, the second largest city in southern Sudan. You see that mango tree? That was the headquarters for the Arabs. 
troops. And this hole here was a trench for the Arab soldiers. And, uh, and they were killing a lot of people here. As we spoke to local residents, one mother voiced her concerns about living near an ammunition dump. Do they worry that this kind of battle will happen again? Life has been relatively peaceful in southern Sudan for the past six years. In 2005, the U.S. brokered a peace treaty that brought an end to 21 years of civil war and granted autonomy to the South. It also scheduled the referendum, and that brings us to today. Those who had fled southern Sudan are now flocking back to their homeland. This woman and her five daughters relocated from Khartoum last month, where she had lived for the past 20 years. You can see all the houses are coming back and people are coming from north and some are coming from uh, Uganda, Kenya and Ethiopia. And it's so good that this place is going to be a livable place, not the killing place anymore. And, uh, Dude knows firsthand the life of a refugee. He was only 11 years old when his village came under attack by the northern army. Our teacher told us to run out, from, get out and see what is going on and then we see people running and then everyone just run without asking anyone. And some were getting killed. You see some running with bleeding. It was 1985, the early years of the Civil War. My village was destroyed by those guys, by this Arab militia. And these, and I couldn't go the, home again. And I didn't know where my parents were, and I didn't know anyone until I met with my uncle on their way. He and his uncle fled with other refugees towards sanctuary in Ethiopia, fighting hunger, disease, and danger. His uncle would not survive, shot by a rival tribe in front of Salva. We just left there with the horror, and from there we buried him and we stayed there for a day mourning for him. And the following day we resume our walk toward Ethiopia. We walk for another month too. And I was the youngest one. In the end, Dute was one of 20,000 young boys separated from their families who walked hundreds of miles to refugee camps. Aid workers named them the Lost Boys, after the characters in Peter Pan. Eleven years later, Salva was offered a chance to resettle in the United States. He ended up in Rochester, New York, and was welcomed into an American family, the Moores, Chris and Louise, and their four children. They are my family in the U.S. Every Christmas card, I'm always on. Christmas card, and I become part of the family. He studied at community college, got a job in a church, and became an American citizen. Then, a call from a cousin that would change his life yet again. He learned his father was alive, but gravely ill. With money contributed from Rochester churches, Dute flew to Sudan to see his father for what he thought would be the last time. My dad's in here. In this video, a few years later, Dute retells the story of their reunion. I didn't know where my dad was for about 19 years. And when I went there to that clinic, I said, hey, dad, how are you? And he said, who are you? I said, I'm Salva Dute. And uh, he was starting with emotion. And uh, he sprayed the water on my body and said that it's, it's a sign of the welcoming back. He feel like I was dead and now I'm coming out from the tomb. Water would become critical to Dute's story. It was a waterborne disease that made his father ill. Ironically, while southern Sudan is a fertile region filled with rivers and arable land, most of the population lacks access to clean water. The problem is the fresh water lies in aquifers deep beneath the surface and it takes a well to reach it. Getting people clean water is a huge challenge in southern Sudan because there is very little infrastructure. Most of the people don't live in cities. Most people live in really rural places where they exist on what they can scrape out of the ground. 
Susan Purden, the director of the International Rescue Committee in southern Sudan, explains why dirty water can be lethal. Diarrhea is one of the leading causes of death of children under the age of five years. And in a place like southern Sudan where there's so little access to improved water sources, um, kids have diarrhea frequently. One out of every seven children here dies before the age of five. And the dirty water is not only dangerous for children, but also for adults, as was the case with Salvadut's father. The doctor told me that if your father needed to live longer, he needed to start drinking clean water. When I went back to U.S., I said I should uh, do something to help my father and other people who are in the same situation. So Dut returned to the United States and founded a nonprofit, Water for Sudan, devoted to digging wells to provide clean water to Sudanese communities across the South. Six years after drilling his first well, Dude is taking us on a journey into the countryside, to the site where he's drilling his 79th well. The South has few roads. A 40-mile journey stretches into three hours. And here we are, long drive. Uh, oh, here's the well, they finish it. Good man, good guys. They struck the water, they blow it up, they test it and uh, everything, and good, yes. I'm happy, and the villagers are happy too. The community pitches in, collecting rocks to form the well's foundation. The new well, near a school where 300 children attend classes in these thatched huts. The headmaster, Charles Magoka Kot, tells us how he has lost six students to waterborne diseases. He took us to the hole in the ground that until now provided the community's main source of water. The water, they are not good. They are killed children. There is some impact, yeah. Disease. Do you drink this water? Yes. Now we see why something as basic as a well is a cause for celebration. The money to drill these wells comes from America. A junior high school in Stillwater, Minnesota, has contributed more than $6,000 towards this well. The Rotary Club, women's groups, and schools across the United States have also sponsored wells. I would say America is my endowment, it's my foundation. Without America, without me going to America, and without people of America opening, welcoming me, opening their heart to help me, to teach me, I wouldn't be able to help my people today. These days, Salva Dude splits his time between drilling in southern Sudan and raising funds and awareness in the United States. When you get the water, you put it in your hat and then walk miles and miles. See? Isn't that, could you do that? Oh, it's so, uh, it's not good. Where you guys get your water? From a drink. Oh, from a drink. For um, a sink or a water bottle that you buy from a store. You see this uh, young man here, these boys? They are digging their own well. It's very important for me to tell them what I knew and let them know that world is not the same. Like American world, American children, all the privilege that they have, other children don't have it. Just before the referendum, a university commencement ceremony is underway in the city of Wow. Still, it's the upcoming vote that's on everyone's mind. Salva Dut sees the ceremony as symbolic of his country as a whole. These are the people we need for our development. I myself cannot do anything alone. But with them, together with us and with me, we will change our country.